into recording. Okay. Okay. And then now it's not necessary to share. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read the, the what Sonia Stefanizzi wrote. Uh, she she wrote it's a pleasure to open uh, this uh, seminar and to welcome on behalf of the Department of Sociology and Social Research the presentation of the book Ecomuseums and Climate Change, edited by Nunzia Borrelli, Peter Davis, and Raul Dal Santo. I think it's important to emphasize the relevance of this book and place it in a sociological analysis perspective for several reasons. First, ecomuseums can involve people consolidating their identity as citizens through a series of actions within a shared project. Second, ecomuseums intend to contribute to the rise of a different project of the future capable of valorizing territorial heritage in a perspective of a collective well-being. Third, in a framework of economic, social and health crisis, the creation of a solid and branched local network rich in relational and social capital assume a crucial importance in determining the capacity of a territory to grow social cohesion even before economic growth. To sum up, ecomuseums represent a form of contamination with other form of participatory governance of action where the landscape becomes a place of a civil and cultural rebirth of our communities and a renewed dialogue with institutions and the non-profit world. I sincerely hope you can have a profitable afternoon, have a good conference. She finished. So, uh, Maurizio Casiraghi maybe reach us uh, later, he sent a message, so we need to, I can give the word to Agostina Lavagnino, yes please. Thank you, Agostina. Thank you, thank you, and it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today for the presentation of this uh, important uh, book, uh, Eco Museums uh, and the Climate Changes. I bring you the uh, personal greetings of our assessore Francesca Caruso, engaged today in other institutional uh, commitments. Uh, let me say about uh, these uh, themes uh, and uh, about uh, this uh, book uh, presentation that uh, cultural institutions are drivers uh, in general of local uh, development, but uh, these particular themes uh, belong uh, to uh, eco-museums, uh, which uh, base uh, their own uh, action on community participation and uh, on uh, sustainable growth of local systems. Eco-museums uh, offer strategic tools uh, and the good practices that can contribute to the global debate on climate change, on biodiversity loss and sustainability. Uh, let me say that current landscapes are largely an outcome of the influence of humans on nature and the coexistence of human and nature in a century long process, very long process. Traditional farming, cultural practices and the local context have created likely diverse mosaic of different cultural landscapes so that uh, from international to local level uh, the goal towards which research and policies converge is the ecological transition. Uh, Ecomuseums are essential to ensure a sustainable future. They play a key role on these themes uh, in increasing knowledge uh, and in arising awareness about uh, these uh, topics, uh, not only, but also in uh, disseminating uh, sustainable practices uh, inside uh, the local uh, communities. Uh, since uh, 2007, Lombardy region has uh, supported uh, eco-museums uh, as uh, cultural institutions. And uh, in 2019, uh, Lombardy region updates uh, the requirements for the regional recognition of this particular, um, particular cultural institution. And uh, with a new call uh, last year, um, Lombardy region recognized two uh, new eco-museums uh, and the new asset today is of 36 uh, eco-museums inside our 
uh, territories uh, recognized uh, by our Lombardy region institution. So I thank uh, all our eco museums uh, for the energy and uh, passion with which they carry out uh, their work uh, in our uh, territories. And I wish everyone uh, a good job uh, thinking uh, to the motto, heritage produce, heritage protects and, and inspires, activating a cooperation process on these uh, themes uh, all over the world, uh, as uh, today we can see. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for your greetings and for your comments. Uh, we sincerely hope that this is the first step uh, to, to reason much more in the future together. Okay, I can give you the words to uh, Alberto. If you want, you can say that. Okay. <clears throat> well, dear friends and colleagues, as a past president of ICOM and now president of ICOM Foundation, I am honored to be with you today. I warmly thank Nunzia Borrelli, Peter Davis, Raul Del Santo for inviting me to the presentation of a volume that I consider a milestone in contemporary museology. This volume is a unique journey through the multivalent diverse, complex, changing and exciting world of the eco museums and museums facing the challenges of the 21st century. Since uh, 1972, when uh, UNESCO and ICOM organized the famous conference in Santiago de Chile, eco museums have given a decisive theoretical and operative contribution to the social role of museums. Museums and eco-museums have different origins, history, experiences, and approach. However, they are part of the global change and face the same global challenges. Sustainable development and climate crisis, digital revolution and urban regeneration, pandemics and conflicts, inequality and racism, migration and inclusion, respect of diversity and decolonization. In recent years, museology and museums have changed radically. I recently wrote the entry Museology and Museography for the Italian Trecani Encyclopedia of Contemporary Art, where I pointed out the role and the impact of new museology and eco-museology on museums theory and practice. The view of museums solely as conservation institutions is now totally outdated. The core functions of museums, research, conservation, exhibition, education, and communication of collections remain a priority. However, museums have taken new responsibilities about the communities they are part of and from which their collections originate. Museums have become communication hubs. They promote participation and inclusion, engage in intercultural dialogue, and address new audiences. Museums and eco-museums live in the contemporary age and deal with the crucial issues and problems of our troubled times. In 2019, UNESCO estimated that there are 104,000 museums all over the world. Each one has its own specific identity and mission. 
eco museums and community museums are fruitful evidence of the diversity of museums. To respond to the growing expectations of communities, ICOM has decided to update the definition of museums approved in 2007. Last year, in Prague, a new definition of museum was enthusiastically approved by ICOM General Assembly. The first sentence of the new definition contains key terms that were already present in the 2007 one. A museum is a not-for-profit permanent institution in the service of society that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. The second and third sentences of the new definition include many innovative concepts. Open to the public, accessible and inclusive, museums foster diversity and sustainability. Museums operate and communicate ethically, professionally, and with the participation of communities, offering varied experiences for education, enjoyment, reflection, and knowledge sharing. Each term of the new definition expresses one of the challenges that museums are facing. The new definition reflects what museums are today and expresses the geographical, cultural, and professional diversity of the global museum community. Many key issues raised by eco museums are relevant in the new ICOM museum definition, as well in several resolutions approved by ICOM General Assembly since 2016. The attention given to diversity, to participation, to sustainable development of communities, as well as, well as to the intangible aspects of communities' heritage. The new ICOM definition aligns with the UNESCO recommendation on the social role of museums and with the United Nations Agenda 2030 and its 17 global goals of sustainable development. In September 2019, ICOM General Assembly in Kyoto passed a resolution on sustainability and the implementation of Agenda 2030. The 2030 Agenda has become the fundamental reference for ICOM's work. In 2021 and 2022, ICOM joined the Global Coalition United for Biodiversity and the Climate Heritage Network. The devastating effects of the climate change and loss of biodiversity continue to impact our natural and cultural heritage globally. A few months ago, newspapers reported that the indigenous man called Man of the Whole died in Brazil. He was the only inhabitant of the Tanaru indigenous territory in Rondonia state and the last surviving member of his tribe, massacred by gunmen, colonists, and ranchers in the 1970s. He was a living proof that indigenous communities are at the forefront of the respect of diversity. Not only are indigenous livelihoods threatened, also their cultural heritage cannot survive without their natural habitats. Even native languages are in constant decline as a result of colonization and of the climate crisis. Fighting the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity is an imperative of our times. No development can be sustainable without culture. And this volume confirms that museums, eco-museums and heritage play a key role in fostering knowledge, awareness, and behavior changes, as well as in supporting environmental policies, mitigation strategies, 
and sustainable practices in local communities. In conclusion, I would like to say that global challenges ask for local coordinated actions. The relevance of museum and eco-museums in the future will depend on how they will be able to confront global change and cooperate on a local level, but also on the national and international scenarios. This volume will become a solid reference book for professionals and volunteers facing social change and global challenges. My best compliments to the editors and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Alberto, for uh, your very interesting speech. We are absolutely agree with you. We need to organize uh, local action because uh, this is the only way to define a global strategy. And uh, we are here for reasoning about that, about which kind of a local action we can image for the future. Okay, we can uh, ask uh, Peter to come here and uh, we can uh, start the second part of, uh, of this event. Um, okay. As I said before, I don't need to say many things. All people that work in the eco museums field know Peter by his uh, papers, books, and uh, and so on. So I ask him to start <laughs> to present uh, our book. And uh, let me say super thank you, Peter, because uh, it was very important for, uh, for uh, publishing this book. Uh, he helped a lot. Uh, definitely, we collected a lot of chapters. And he helped a lot for not only in reading the contents of every chapter, but also for the English. <laughs> he helped us a lot. So thank you very much because he dedicated all summer. <laughs> we work all summer, and uh, but we are happy for the result that we obtaining. So thank you again, Peter. Okay. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank, thank you, Nancy, and it's it's absolutely great to be here. Uh, absolutely delighted actually to be in Milan. So many thanks to the University of. Uh, Milan Bicocca for hosting this event and inviting me to speak and say a little bit about this book, Eco Museums and Climate Change, which we as editors are very proud of. Uh, my thanks go also to the previous speakers for their institutional greetings. Uh, as you've heard from Alberto, ICOM were very supportive of the conference that inspired this book, a conference that attracted more than 100 delegates. So we're hugely grateful to ICOM for the support. There are several other organizations and people I need to thank, but at the top of my list go my co-editors here, uh, Nuncia and, and Raul, who kindly accepted my, I have to admit, often picky and challenging interventions and fussy English corrections. But they were a, an absolute pleasure to work with. And of course, the same can be said of all the authors who contributed to this book, profiling their personal and institutions' efforts to tackle climate change issues and work towards the sustainable development goals. As an editor, I learned a great deal from all of them. So working with them, for me, was a very enriching experience. So yes, it was hard work, but I learned a great deal. So thank you very much. And I must end my thanks really for the marvelous support we received from our publishers, Ledizione, and from Nicola in particular. Um, they acquired the funds from a climate change foundation to enable the participation and publication of this book. Um, so uh, not only did they actually produce a, a very attractive book, but they actually found the money to enable it to be published at all. So it wouldn't have happened without them. So thanks very much to them. So this book, I regard it as a treasure trove. So inside it, you will find wisdom, creativity, dynamism, perseverance, and fortitude that all the authors demonstrate, often facing huge problems to deliver their aims alongside their local communities. These problems include money, or more often the lack of it, which is also a problem, 
but also local politics and local politicians are not easy to navigate. Maintaining the interest in heritage projects is also always a challenge. I think starting projects is one thing, but keeping the energy and commitment of volunteers is not easy. And of course, that's how eco museums work. Often they don't have paid staff, but they work entirely um, with volunteer groups and, and with individuals. So, in these 382 pages and 17 <laughs> diverse chapters, it's a big book, okay? Uh, you will find the theoretical guidance and practical examples of how eco museums have risen to the challenges of supporting their communities. They've sought not only to find solutions to immediate problems, but also to prepare strategies for what is an unknown but predictably difficult future. The earth is in trouble and we are indeed walking a tightrope to the sun as the artist Joey Guidone's cover illustration captures so brilliantly. I was so pleased to find this artist and find this illustration for the cover because I think it's a wonderful evocative cover for the book. So thanks to him also. And art, of course, is you know, such an important asset for informing and challenging people. Uh, and it is profiled in many of the chapters throughout the book, um, but especially so by Ginevra Addison's uh, chapter, who looks at the use of contemporary art in eco museums. So that's a really interesting one to look at. I don't plan to describe the book's contents in detail, but it is important, I think, to ind indicate to you it's international scope with contributions not only from Italy, but also from Spain, Canada, Brazil, Tanzania, Scotland and Poland. The book actually is in two parts and the first six chapters take a more theoretical stance and include an exploration of the connections between uh, eco museum principles and the sustainable development goals. The description of a pro proposed model to uh, aid museum transformation, an account of the Eco Heritage Project, which you've heard a little bit about already at the start of the meeting, uh, and also observations on how democratic processes can enable eco museums to aid the SDGs and climate change issues. In the second part, you'll find wide ranging ideas and approaches to tackling climate issues and the SDGs, which reflect in many ways, I think, the pliable and plastic nature of the eco museum concept itself. All eco, -museum, all eco museums adapt to their specific social, cultural, and environmental contexts. So you'll find practical ideas that may be useful to you in your situation, particularly those relating to tourism, place marking, marketing, and its potentially positive economic impact. Reading these chapters, you'll also realize that important social issues, which have been touched on already, including population growth, inequality, migration, globalization, and the environmental problems of habitat loss, biodiversity loss, and pollution are a focus for eco-museum activists. So perhaps we could or should regard these issues as the driving force behind what we seek to achieve within our communities and the landscapes that we care for. Eco-museums are social institutions, and this comes across very clearly in all the chapters in this book. However, I would like to single out Gelsom Almeida's chapter about the Eco Museo Il Grande in Brazil as one specific example of social impact. This Eco Museum, founded in 1999, has found ways of helping the island's citizens and their economy, which for many years was based on agriculture and fishing, but is now experiencing the impact of mass tourism. The island is now arguably one of the most visited tourist destinations in Brazil, and the island's traditional communities, 
with their own customs, traditions, and identity feel threatened. So importantly, the Eco Museum has created spaces, exhibition areas, a community library, botanical garden, artisan workshops, and a community center. Spaces where residents can meet and participate in discussions about the island's future. Difficult issues are dealt with too, so including a special health project to prevent suicide, monitoring the threatened marine environment that surrounds the island, creating innovative ways of recycling. So I feel this Eco Museum and its activities deserve to be better known in the museum world. And I hope this book will help to spread the word. At an online meeting last week in La Ponte Eco Museum in Spain, I was asked to say something about the book and why it's important. It's really not a difficult case to make. If you watch or read the news, you have seen that climate predictions remain very, very worrying. With high temperatures likely to be reached across Europe between now and 2027. This year we will probably see the highest temperatures ever recorded in Europe being broken yet again. Climate is now unpredictable. Droughts, floods, extreme weather events will become more common. And here in Italy, I don't have to tell you a bit about this, the extreme rain and floods in Emilia Romana resulted in the deaths of several people and an estimate of several millions of euros of damage and a major loss to culture and nature. In Spain, 20% of the country is exper experiencing extreme drought and even the wonderful wetland of the Doniana is under threat. Okay. Yes. You, you need to get me a bit closer. Okay. Yes, closer, yes. So finally, um, I'm going to come back to Leonardo. And when you get hold of the book, you can see that I mentioned him actually in the introduction. When I started thinking about the introduction for the book, I was actually reading uh, Isaac Jacobson's uh, biography of Leonardo, which is a, you know, a fantastic book. And I learned of his fascination or Leonardo's fascination with the idea of apocalypse and how it influenced much of his artwork and writing. And I wonder how Leonardo, Leonardo would actually feel about the current state the earth is in, because in effect, we are now facing what Leonardo only ever imagined. So what solutions might he have devised? interesting one to think about. Unfortunately, we don't have a genius like Leonardo to help us. We've rather just got rather inept politicians, I'm afraid. Well, that's certainly the case in the UK anyway, maybe different here in Italy. But solutions to immediate and local problems and strategies for the future can be developed through local action. And that is where muse eco museums can play a role. Eco museums can inform and energize communities they can be a catalyst for action. They can find ways of promoting the means of transitioning to living more sustainably. So this book deserves to be widely read. It may be different in Italy, but certainly in other parts of Europe and certainly in much of the English speaking world, world eco museum actions are largely missed or even ignored by most of the museum world. Certainly most museum curators I've met would not be able to define what eco museums are or what they do. This book has the potential and the ability to change those perceptions. We need to see the book being widely reviewed in the museum press, in journals and in newsletters. We need to make sure that it features in ICOM's uh, e-newsletters to its members. So I'd like to end with a plea, really. Please promote the book. Make it better known. You know, use your contacts, use your colleagues. Say, hey, I've just read this great book. You should see it. It's really important. It's a good read. Spread the word. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
You can see here. Please. Do you want to say something? Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Peter. We sincerely appreciate your presentation. I would like just to say that in this case, it's very easy to promote our book because it is an open source. So we don't need it. Where we are, where he say promote the book, he just wanted to say let people. Uh, let let inf inform people that this book was produced and that it's possible to uh, very, it's very easy to download the hit and uh, to read the, the contents. Like, very few words I wanted to add to what Peter say and uh, because we are in a department of sociology and social research, let me to remember uh, the, um, the, the what, what Anthony Giddens said, that is a very famous sociologist, what Anthony Giddens says about the relationship among, among the agency and the structure. Structure, as maybe many of us know, is the way of thinking, our way of thinking and our way of doing. And what Giddens wants to highlight is that our way of thinking and our way of doing can be changed by the social action. So this is what we are trying to do. We wanted to work on social action because we are sure that it's possible to work on the way of doing and the way of thinking. It's possible to work on the discourse and practices. So this event is a way for us to start thinking to social action that can be in some way work on the, the discourse and practices that are consolidated in the structure that, but that can be changed. So now I can let the word to the discussant. We can start with uh, Michael Jacobson. He is the co-founder of the National Food Museum in Washington. Thank you very much, Michael, to be connected. I sincerely appreciate it also because I know that is, uh, you are in Washington, in Washington is the uh, morning, is, and I know also that uh, you have another uh, meeting uh, in uh, maybe in 20 minutes, I know. Okay, so I immediately ask you to start uh, making some comments to the book and uh, other um, advice. Maybe we can also put it there. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay, Michael, can we hear you? Do, yes. do you need to share some document or not? Uh, no, uh, okay. no, screen, okay. no screen sharing. Um, thank you very much, Nunzia, for inviting me to participate in this in this meeting, and congratulations to you and your editors, yeah. co-editors, for producing this uh, really um, remarkable, innovative book. Um, I'd like to start by telling you a little about who I am and how I get here. Um, I guess you know, my association with museums started when I was probably four or five years old. I lived in Chicago and my family uh, regularly went to some of the major museums in Chicago. And then I'll skip ahead a little, got a little older. And about 45, 50 years ago, I co-founded the Center for Science in the Public Interest. That is a consumer advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. We focus mostly on nutrition and food safety issues, and we led successful campaigns to obtain federal laws to require nutrition labels on packaged foods, to ban artificial trans fat, to improve the nutritional quality of school meals, improve food safety laws, and other things. Uh, we also were not just an, an advocacy lobbying organization, but an educational organization. Uh, we published the Nutrition Action Health Letter that at one point had over a million paid subscribers in the United States and Canada. The, um, and I didn't realize, but uh, we also sponsored several activities related to museums. One was a report on science museums and the corporate influences on those museums. Uh, some of them, like the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago and a museum in, in Los Angeles, were almost like uh, industry trade shows where they rented out space to major companies to install their products um, 
um, a, a major tractor company, General Motors, and others. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't call it a pop-up exhibit or a traveling exhibit, but we we sponsored a couple of projects. We sent uh, two nutritionists around the country in a brightly painted van, and they stopped at schools, senior citizen centers, radio stations, television stations, and they had with them um, devices to talk about nutrition models of food, for instance, uh, packages of food, so they can talk about labeling and deceptive labeling. And they went on a journey of about 7,000 miles talking about nutrition. And we had another project where we built a junk food hall of shame. It was a um, book, it was essentially a bookcase with glass fronted doors, like a museum uh, case might have. And in that we had dis uh, displays showing different aspects of food. One, for instance, showed the um, it deconstructed sugar frosted flakes, a popular breakfast cereal, showing what it was made of. We had a bowl of five ounces of, of corn flour, five ounces of sugar, because it was 50% sugar, and then a tube with artificial colorings, flavorings, and preservatives. And when we um, showed that to the public, it generated global publicity and increased the number of uh, visitors to the venue uh, enormously. So I didn't know that those, that those kinds of things would, uh, in my background, would ultimately lead to the founding of a museum, the National Food Museum. And that museum, don't come to Washington now expecting to visit it. We're at an early stage uh, developing a strategic plan and then the fundraising. So maybe in four or five years, come to Washington and we will have a wonderful museum. And it's going to feature activities on many aspects of food, cultural, historical, and scientific. And my particular interests are the effect of diet on health and the effect of farming on climate change and other environmental issues. So I'm new to the museum world and hope you'll excuse my relative ignorance of what has been happening with this burgeoning world of eco-museums. Your book, Eco Museums and Climate Change, is a great introduction to those institutions. I was really impressed by the many museums, especially in Europe, but really throughout the world, that are involving their local communities in highlighting their heritage and protecting the local ecosystem, not just the natural ecosystem, but also the cultural ecosystem. However, I was surprised that the book, with its title including the words climate change, and the many eco museums discussed in the book, does devoted little attention to the topic of climate change. For instance, the term greenhouse gas was only mentioned half a dozen times in a book of roughly 350 pages. For somebody, in, somebody like me interested in food, diet, and farming, I hope that eco-museums, as well as traditional museums, would devote significant attention to those very important topics. After all, what we eat is a major contributor to climate change. Globally, food and agriculture account for about one-third of greenhouse gas emissions. And animal agriculture accounts for almost half of that, 15%. That's equivalent to the transportation sector. And cattle are responsible for two thirds of animal agriculture's role in greenhouse gas emissions. Yet the words beef, meat, and methane do not appear once in the book. I was very surprised. 
And then, of course, in addition, food and farming have additional impacts that, in, that occur at local, national, and global levels, such as air and water pollution, degradation of the herb ocean floor, food waste and landfills, and the loss of biodiversity. And of course, what we eat has enormous health impacts. Meat, especially processed meats like bacon and ham and dairy products, contribute significantly to heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. In the United States, more than one out of six deaths, half a million deaths a year, are caused by what people eat. Fortunately, the dietary changes would, that would protect the environment are generally the same ones that would protect health. And in a nutshell, in summary, it means we should be eating a more plant-based diet. We don't have to all become pure vegans, but we should definitely move in the direction of plant-based diets. Eco-museums are ideal venues for engaging the community on environmental and dietary issues, especially because food and farming are not abstract concepts, but things to which everybody can relate. Such museums could certainly celebrate the food cultures of people who have lived in a town for centuries. They could also celebrate the food ways of recent immigrants. They could explain where food used to be grown and where food is now grown and manufactured. They could trace dietary changes over the past hundred years, in many cases, going from a diet of mostly locally produced natural foods to both packaged and fresh foods produced thousands of miles away. We live in a global food system. And they can inform people about how our food choices may lead to excessive greenhouse gas emissions, how climate change affects community health and the visitor's own health, and the kinds of diets that are far healthier for the planet and the person. The means of engagement can take all kinds of forms, interactive exhibits and activities at the museums, temporary exhibits at community centers and train stations, discussions with local farmers and, and environmentalists, and activities at schools and online for children and adults. Museums could offer an integrated view of climate change, other environmental problems, public health, and even worker justice and animal welfare. Of course, the topic of climate change does not belong only at small local eco-museums, but all museums, including science and art museums, as well as historical centers. Large urban museums certainly have the capacity to sponsor activities in their local communities. I think in particular of the Smithsonian Institution, a large museum complex here in Washington, DC. They have huge museums, but they also have sponsored a small community-oriented museum, which you might consider an eco-museum in a low-income part of Washington. It had an exhibit on food that showed how local community activists over the past century mounted efforts to influence major and also to school children. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you much success in your conference and in the broader efforts to strengthen eco-museums in Italy and throughout the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So oh, just one moment. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Too much technology for us. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Michael. I sincerely appreciate your uh, your um, contributions. Uh, I would like just to, let, let me just to say two things. 
um, and that maybe can also help us to clarify the main aim of this book. When we suggest to the Eco Museums to write chapters uh, about what they are doing uh, for the climate action and for sustainable development goals, we uh, we know because we have already done a survey that this topic was not. Uh, so much tackled by the eco museums, but our idea was also to stimulate eco museums in a reasoning uh, about what they already done and what they can also do in the future. So the main aim of the book was uh, to give a stimuli, give some stimuli to the eco museums and also for reasoning about how they can improve their activities in the climate action field and in the sustainability field. I would like just to underline this point that was not uh, enough um, highlight before. Okay, thank you. Then I can ask to Rita Capurro to... Come here. To join us. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Rita. Rita, she's a colleague. She works here in the University of, uh, of Milano Bicocca, and uh, she's also one of the coordinators of a very interesting project of an open museum here in Bicocca. So thank you very much, Rita, to be here to, to, thank today. Thank you for your invitation. And unfortunately, my partner in crime, uh, I know. Kazzucoli, uh, is involved in a PhD discussion. Same, so yes, it's a very full day. Today is an <laughs> yeah, incredible so day. Yes, it's a crazy day for Bicocca. I'm sorry for that. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to, to have a, a little talk about uh, this uh, in very interesting book. As uh, in all experience uh, in museums, uh, also in the experience of books, uh, I used to find, uh, look for in the book or in a museum, something that has to do with me or my experience. So uh, when Alberto Garlandini was the first to introduce to me this book, uh, sharing the information of this publication, I immediately downloaded it and read it. And uh, well, um, from the title, Eco Museum and Climate Change, what uh, has to do with, with me and with uh, my museums, that is a university museum. Well, uh, the thing interesting is that I found a lot of things about uh, my museum and my, my experience in this book because uh, the thing is, the, as uh, Nunzi said before, our museum is a, a new kind of museum. She, she talked about an open museum, but uh, we can call it also an extended museum, like Alberto defined in, the, in this book, or a a diffused museum, as in many other uh, other books, uh, this kind of museum is defined. Uh, why in the university we have a diffused museum, and which are the characteristics that uh, put together what this book says with our museums? Well, the idea is exactly to create something that is uh, created by a community such as in the Eco Museum and the diffused museum as the Eco Museums are, is something that was born and created uh, in the 70s. Uh, in, uh, they, they, they are both rooted in the new museology and uh, the idea of uh, Andrei Migliani and Freddy Drugman that firstly in Italy talk about uh, the, the, the diffused museum is the idea to uh, uh, involve an entire landscape in, uh, uh, as an object of a museum. So in our case, uh, the landscape of Bicocca doesn't seem to be so meaningful uh, in the discourse of uh, eco-museum and climate change. But uh, the idea is to create a museum that has to connect the different uh, part of our communities that is done by the community of the university and the students and the researchers and the teachers and all the personnel that work in the university that can in some way through this museum know and share their experience in a participatory way. Uh, this museum has, has been just inaugurated well to be, to be honest, 
hasn't been inaugurated and it will never be inaugurated. And uh, because more than a space is a process, a process that try to connect as in the process of creation of an eco museum collections that are present and researches and many other activities and uh, uh, visions present in the university that can be a common field where to work. Uh, in, in this uh, recent, uh, recent month, uh, uh, our university is uh, involved in a very huge, important project called the MUSA, Multilayered Urban Sustainability Project, that uh, put uh, uh, attention uh, toward the, the aspects of sustainability, how a university can be sustainable. And uh, in the field uh, of research, of course, this part is really, really studied, but also in practice activities. And what we can do in uh, this museum to be uh, active in this kind of, uh, of background? Well, for example, uh, we try to connect activities and uh, uh, to share these activities with the external world of university. Um, the university recently had a new space that is a garden and uh, in this garden, the different researchers, the researchers are working on uh, uh, plants and insects. And we facilitate the, uh, the, the, the population of the neighborhood and also of the city to, uh, uh, to, to visit this garden and to know how this garden can be relevant for, uh, uh, for the city and for a little action also towards uh, the sustainability in this specific place. Well, uh, just to come back to the book and strictly on the book, uh, well, I found one thing that a bit disappointed me. That is uh, the, um, to put uh, as uh, something that are uh, to be opposite, eco-museums and traditional museums. Well, uh, in the middle, there are many experiences of museum and this kind of hybrid, hybridization, such as our experience of the diffuse museum, we think that is one of these uh, kind of hybrid that have a lot to do with uh, the experience of eco museum, the community and the center, uh, uh, the collection important, but uh, something that has to um, connect and create uh, uh, discussion about the, 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 uh, the, the, the collection itself. Um, the discourse on, of uh, social justice that has to be promoted in the, in the museum and all the elements that we can find in the new definition of icon of museum where, that uh, are really, really well uh, represented in this kind of museum that sometimes are called radical such as something a bit weird, but maybe weird could mean also useful for the contemporaneity. And uh, we hope to be weird, active, radical, and uh, active also in, uh, in, uh, uh, in activities for the promotion of uh, a new sensitivity to the, uh, the issues related to climate change. So I stop because I don't want to <laughs> waste the time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, Rita, for your interesting um, contribution. And thank you very much also for the big job that you are doing uh, here in the University of Bicocca for the development of the standing museums. As you say, diffuse museums, we have to define what is the right noun. But definitely the project is very interesting. And I think that uh, the work that you are doing, uh, it's very interesting. And in the future, we can see the result. Concerning what you say, I partially agree with about what you said at the end of your contribution. Um, the main point for us was that we, we have to make a choice. 
we have to select the, uh, the, the, how we want to, we have to take the decision on how to tackle this important issue. And anyway, I, I agree when you say that uh, many things, uh, we, we missed many things uh, that can be tackled when we talk about the SDGs and the climate action. But this is a first, as, a, as we are repeating uh, from the beginning of, uh, of this event, this is a, just a starting point. We are, we have, this is not a derival point. This is the starting point for investigating in a different way uh, the, the, these issues. Our interest is to be able to open a debate, uh, maybe also in another, also developing a new publication in the future that can help us to investigate much better this, uh, this topic that is important now, that, but that we are completely sure it will be still important in the future. So maybe in the future we can start thinking about uh, a new product uh, where other topic can be considered. Okay, Jacopo, uh, last but not least, as we say, <laughs> Jacopo Bencini is from the, an NGO. He worked for Italian Climate Network. And uh, we are very happy to have you here with uh, your comments because you come from another world. You are not in the museum and eco museum uh, field, but you are in some way connected on this topic because you, you, you and your organization work a lot on the climate action and climate change. So please. Thank you very much, uh, Nunzia, and uh, thank you for, for inviting the Italian Climate Network to, uh, to this uh, book launch. Um, I have to, to say that it has been a true pleasure uh, reading the book recently, also because as an NGO we usually do not um, we, we do not tackle museums as part of our work, even though after reading the book I have the feeling we should. And uh, I know that this connection um, between Milano Bicocca, your research team, and us uh, originated from contacts with the coordinator of our education department, Maria de Pasquale, who I think is there uh, at Bicocca uh, right now. And um, I think, Maria, we should work a bit on that. Uh, so as Italian Climate Network, we are an NGO um, specialized in monitoring the international process, international negotiations under the UNFCCC on climate change, so climate mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage related to uh, climate adverse effects. And uh, we are also very active in the dissemination and popularization of uh, climate change uh, matters and everything rela related to climate in schools in Italy and uh, in universities around Italy. So definitely, I, I think this event could be a linking point between the work of uh, your research team again in the university and what we do. And uh, actually I have found um, a very strict link uh, when it comes to ACE, uh, which is an acronym that in English stands for Action for Climate Empowerment under the United Nations Framework for Climate Change. Um, I have found linkages to, to this in, a ch in the chapter written by Harry McGee, uh, which I already knew for his amazing work uh, with museums and eco-museums and the mainstreaming of sustainability policies in your field. And um, as I said, we work a lot on action for climate empowerment uh, and there have been several uh, decisions and uh, um, policy papers, let's say policy decisions adopted over the years under the United Nations aiming at actually, again, mainstreaming climate policies through all possible ways, in all possible ways, through all possible languages. And uh, as Italian Climate Network, we um, are somehow of an informal contact point even for our ministry in Italy in terms of developing together these new languages and understanding how to actually uh, get to reach people outside of our climate bubble. Um, this was not easy yet crucial um, concerning young people before uh, Fridays for Future and the whole Greta movement in 2018-2019. Now it is fundamental to build interlinkages and intergenerationality uh, because young people are somehow aware and into the thing uh, since some year, but uh, people aged 40, 50 or more uh, still uh, somehow mm, very often have some difficulties in entering the topic because it's something we are not used to uh, or we were not used to until uh, 10 to 15 years ago. So in that sense, um, 
looking back at decisions under the United Nations where museums, and in this case, eco-museums and open-air museums are uh, a key, play a key role in uh, um, building this climate empowerment on territories, then it's definitely something uh, we should work uh, on and collaborate as NGOs and civil society with realities such as uh, the many, many, many eco-museums that we have. Uh, also here in Italy and around Europe. Uh, I very much agree with some of the uh, key messages um, of the book, um, such for instance as the importance in this kind of museums uh, in terms of positive transformation of territories. I myself live uh, in an eco-museum area in the province of Florence in Italy. Actually, I'm also a councillor in a municipality which was a funder of an eco-museum here and um, this positive transformation um, has to uh, go through some um, interactive uh, challenges, let's say, when it comes to explaining to people what we are doing and uh, uh, linking all these high level topics, if you want to say that, um, such as climate mitigation, climate adaptation to the real life of people on territories. And uh, I have been um, experiencing myself in my own experience how difficult that could be. But uh, eco-museums compared to traditional museums in the old definition, if we want to say that, uh, also according to the new definitions by ICOM, are more dynamic, could be more dynamic. And they live together with the territory and the people living their territory, and they evolve with the people. And in that sense, I think it could be interesting to understand and to also ask us somehow philosophical question, uh, how uh, should we understand uh, the ideas of conservation, the ideas, the idea of heritage in a world that is changing so fast and uh, in a world that is experiencing changes that are happening so fast and to which, well, at least to many of them, we should get um, used to and adapt somehow as climate change, as we know, is a problem that cannot be stopped, but can, all, can all, all, mm, only be uh, somehow mitigated or ralented somehow. Um, moreover, again, eco-museums bring a local perspective into the uh, topics of uh, conservation, heritage and territory. And uh, um, in this sense, it, it could be also interesting to, um, to, to, to reverse the process and understand how to bring these local voices and this uh, local need to protect the environment people are actually um, living in to the higher levels of politics, which could be, uh, could be quite challenging, of course. Um, I also very much agree with the idea in the book that eco-museums bring development, and not just in terms of jobs, not just in terms of, um, the, the, again, the, the dynamics that they could bring on the territory, but also in terms of how to build a development which is uh, which respects nature, which respects the climate, and and uh, how this, how do we, what do we intend for development again? If we want to make it a philosophical question of uh, meaning, and I think that the link again, um, which is uh, very clear in the book between the role of eco museums and the SDGs, and I would add, and the Paris Agreement at the state level. Uh, is essential and key in this very historic moment. Uh, and uh, uh, more and more we need to empower this local knowledge and to uh, build linkages with the, with the national level. Um, one of the questions in the book that I, uh, that I very liked is how, to, how can these eco-museums help reverse the trend? But I would like to reverse the question. How can we as civil society promote this new vision of um, understanding the nature you're living, understand the um, social environment in which you live in and the linkages with nature and the climate? Uh, and um, a discussion before me um, underlined that climate change actually was not that key uh, in terms of an established topic into the book, but I'm not sure whether I agree, and I really thank you, Nuncia, for, for answering that, because um, inserting climate change as uh, part of the vision of this new um, field, let's say, of researching the interaction between eco-museums and climate change is itself climate action somehow, if we read it from the point of view of climate empowerment. 
um, because it was because, simply because it wasn't there until some years ago, simply because it wasn't there. And that's already positive from our point of view. It helps uh, raising awareness uh, through bottom up approaches and through the role of people. And um, in this sense, we can talk perhaps about a sort of marriage uh, between uh, aesthetics, sustainability, history, heritage, and uh, by sustainability, we of course intend climate change. Um, 380 and something more uh, pages of new narratives. Uh, I would like to close by saying that when I start when I started reading this book, I was not entirely sure um, what um, what I would have said in this in, in this meeting in this presentation today as we are very used to um, for monitoring negotiations of course we are very used to high level language and very uh, nerdy language if you allow me to in terms of climate change mitigation adaptation uh, carbon capture and storage and all this kind of uh, technical language that even though we come from politics i i, I mean i myself i i come from a political science background as many of us uh, we are getting used to that, which is very mechanic, which is very technical, which is very technologic, uh, if we if you want. But uh, um, we need to understand that to build this uh, empowerment of people, we also need all languages. And uh, I realized that uh, some of the great examples and good practices that are mentioned in the book are somehow already the carriers of new languages to bring the same message which is the message of sustainability and the message to uh, actually um, the need to take care of the planet where we were born on um, again it's a matter of languages it's a matter of philosophical questions we would like we, we want and we need to to ask ourselves but uh, uh, i think that uh, there is on top of everything there is a bridge which need, needs to be built between this kind of conversation, what we see at the UN every year, what we see in schools, uh, and the way we explain climate change to young people, and uh, in this sense to build together a narrative which could fit every kind of conversation and not just uh, silos conversations divided per academic background or experience in cultural heritage on or cultural work somehow. So um, again, I thank you very much uh, as Italian Climate Network and uh, on behalf of all the other volunteers and, and uh, staff for inviting us to this book presentation. And I do think that uh, this field of research needs civil society, needs other voices to complete this new narrative we would like to build together. And uh, we are here in, uh, in any case to help. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacopo, for your contribution. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that you think that we need to start to collaborate. This is exactly what we say when I talk the first time with, uh, with Maria. Thank you, Maria, to be here. And so definitely, um, this is the reason why we invite you to, to these uh, events. I am uh, also agree um, and on another point in particular, but maybe we can return on something that was said by the discussers also at the end of the, um, the presentation of the author's contribution. But I absolutely agree about the language, the necessity to work also on the language. It's very important, and this is the reason why we are trying to create contact with uh, other organizations that uh, are working on uh, this topic uh, because we need to find a common language that can be more uh, clear for for people uh, for the target of our of our contributions so um, we need to work a lot on, on that point uh, i i understood what what you say and uh, we share your, your i share your point of view Thank you again to be here, and I think that we are in time, we are perfectly in time, <laughs> so we can uh, start uh, hearing uh, some contribution from the authors, and then we can uh, uh, try to, to reason about um, how we can work in the future. So the first contribution is from uh, Raul Dal Santo, that is here, and uh, Douglas Worth. Hi, Douglas. Can you see Douglas? Disconnected. connected. 
Douglas? Right. I think I finally figured out where to do the turn things on. Uh, so I need to uh, open up. Are you, uh, Nunzia? Are you running the slides, or am I? I can do that if um, if you want. Yeah, we are sharing your slides. Okay. Um, all right, so, okay, there's all sorts of pop-ups that are <laughs> jumping out at me as well here. Um, and let me just grab my notes. Um, well, um, thank you <clears throat> uh, to everybody who's been involved in this project. Um, it has been an incredible uh, honor and, and, um, and privilege to be, to be part of this. And especially for me to work with Raul, um, we've been actually working together for some years now um, um, with Eco Museum issues, but it has been a, a special treat to um, uh, to work on this project with the original conference and uh, all of its um, materials that came out of it, and now um, through the book. And so I am thrilled to be part of it. Uh, and so we've got several slides here. Um, there we go. Okay. So uh, we are, uh, Raul and I have worked on, on a project that has had a number of uh, components. One of them is um, um, looking at this model that I had developed uh, some years ago called the inside outside um, uh, model. And, uh, and uh, he has taken the model and actually applied it um, over a period of the last several years uh, in the Eco Museum in Parabiaggio. And so that has been um, uh, the second part. We've got two chapters in the, in the book, one on the model, one on the case study. And uh, so we're going to cover some of that territory today. And uh, Raul is going to also talk about, uh, in addition to the case study, uh, the Eco Heritage um, uh, Project. Okay. All right. And so here you'll see my inside-outside model, and I'm just going to leave it there um, as I as I make the these remarks. Um, so essentially, I've been a museologist for um, more than 45 years now, based in Toronto, Canada, and my professional focuses were interpretive planning and integrated audience research. For the last half of my career, um, I have focused on the cultural dimensions of the Anthropocene. So specifically, I've explored the values, the motivations, skills, methods, etc., that are needed to help catalyze meaningful cultural change that is relevant to our moment in history. The, uh, the, the contribution in this book really is this tool, um, and uh, it's called the inside-outside model. And it, despite its, its looking rather complex, it's very simple uh, um, idea. It's basically looking at the museum and what it has control over um, directly and, and what it can do with um, that control to leverage activities across the living culture. And so one of the thing it features is this gap between the living culture, which happens in daily life, and institutionalized culture, which often happens inside institutions. And uh, it's part of the problem of traditional museums is that they they really uh, have difficulty reaching out and impacting the larger world beyond. Um, but it's, uh, we're, now we're particularly looking at forces like climate change and loss of biodiversity and species loss. Um, and these are fundamentally reshaping our world. And when we consider that these worrying trends are not the problem that need to be fixed, but rather are symptoms, um, of greater and deeper dysfunction, then we, we come face to face with the reality that it is the culture that we actually embrace and, and live 
that is the driver of these things that are becoming um, these such dangerous trends. And, and uh, uh, we need to be able to adapt culturally um, to live in the world um, that we now occupy. So as our world changes, human cultures must adapt and they strive to, um, uh, as they strive to maintain stability and to address the needs of people. Now museums can help these processes of adaptation to occur if they develop the skills and motivations to undertake this work. To do this will be a challenge, especially because they weren't designed to do this kind of work, impact oriented work. Eco museums, on the other hand, were designed um, in this kind of way and do have a tradition of focusing on the well being of a region, um, including the health of residents in relationship to each other and to the natural world. And they, they see that process as a very participatory one uh, that engages and involves all people, not just in their leisure time, but rather in their lives. So the inside outside model exists to remind museum practitioners of what is needed in this turbulent time of increasing climate change. Um, um, is that we really need a living culture um, uh, that is co-creating change that will move all stakeholders in this collaboration towards dynamically stable well-being. In addressing the challenge of cultural well-being, um, on our complex planet. Context is everything, and most essential is to acknowledge that we have entered the time of the Anthropocene, which is a geological epoch, uh, the exact details of which are still being negotiated. Um, but what is critical to acknowledge is that in recent decades, humanity has entered a time in which its values, goals, actions, and societal systems have become the number one force shaping Earth's natural systems. Increasing climate change is big, but it's only one of many worrying trends like biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, extinctions, deforestation, and more. The implication is that without significant change to culture, Across local and global levels, the planet's natural systems will become dangerously and destructively destabilized. It's an unprecedented situation for our species. It's worth remembering that human cultures have always adapted to change in the world. The impacts of human activity, both intended and unintended, have historically been quite local. But more recently, as humans used energy from fossil fuels to pursue ever greater ambitions, the negative side effects and negative, largely unintended side effects have grown exponentially. It's now clear that scaling um, the use of fossil-based energy has distinct limitations on our finite planet. But there are viable solutions, but they will be disruptive. The Anthropocene is perhaps the biggest and ultimate test of the power of human creativity to envision a future in which our species can thrive ethically and uh, equitably without sending our planet into the sixth great extinction, which is the point at which we currently find ourselves. Many traditional museums plan for program outputs. These are the products that are designed for leisure time consumption by those who have the time and resources to visit museums. But often these exhibits and programs stop short of planning for co-creative impacts that ripple across the larger living culture, adapting and changing to an ever evolving world. Uh, addressing climate change and fostering a culture of sustainability are amongst the most pressing challenges of our times. If museums and eco-museums can see themselves as catalysts of cultural change and adaptation, then we need new tools, skills, and priorities that are oriented to creating impacts in the larger living culture. And in concert with the stakeholders that live across uh, this living culture of ours, it'll be a large challenge to bridge the gap between the living culture and the institutionalized culture. It will require re deep reflection, 
dialogue, empathy, shared vision, and co-creative actions. Museums can't do it alone. They will require the creativity that can be found in every corner of human endeavor. The good news is that humanity and all of its rich diversity has these capacities. So that concludes my remarks and uh, I will pass the, uh, the, yeah, the, the slideshow on to Raul. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, it was an honor to work with you. In uh, the, this book is uh, yes, is a goals, but uh, especially is a step in a process. That and I, I show you what happened in Parabiago in my eco museum uh, after uh, the work with uh, Douglas and. Uh, the other authors of the book. Uh, first of all, we um, made a, an analysis of impact. Then we wrote uh, um, two chapters in the book. Uh, and then in Miami Museum, we um, wrote a new midterm Eco Museum action plan. Um, and also, we translated in Italian um, the, the two ch chapters. At uh, the European level, something happened with the, the Eco Heritage um, project. Uh, with this uh, project, some useful tools have been created both for European and worldwide eco museums. So we uh, have uh, case studies, toolkit, learning modules. Uh, about uh, eco, the first uh, goal of this, pro this uh, eco heritage project, uh, there is the um, analysis of uh, 13 uh, European uh, case studies. For each of uh, these cases, for example, La Ponte Eco Museum in Spain, we, we, have, uh, we wrote characteristics, processes, commitment on development uh, goals, and, uh, and so on. So in the website, we, you can uh, see this, uh, this work on uh, about uh, Europe. Also, we... Uh, we wrote uh, uh, tools, a toolkit for a, a eco museum. Um, they are uh, useful tools uh, um, for eco museum that uh, um, start uh, their work, but also that uh, want to improve their they work. Uh, Two of these tools uh, refers uh, to the inside outside impact model. Um, this is the, the first tool, a Museum Evaluation and Impact Monitoring. And this uh, is the other, a Museum Planification. Um, the last goal of uh, the Eco Heritage uh, project. Uh, concern a, a specific training module um, about EQ Museum and sustainability. The learning module provides information and suggestion regarding the use and implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals in the EQ Museums, uh, both with the suggestion of Harry McGuy and uh, Douglas Ward with uh, his uh, inside outside impact model. Um, and uh, I also uh, want to, to, to thank uh, Douglas and the other author because uh, of their uh, suggestion, the relevant suggestion in, uh, uh, the, for this uh, European uh, Eco Heritage project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul.
Thank you, Raul, and thank you, Douglas. I'm a, it's much better if we interrupt this one. Okay. Okay. I can ask to Clark, Clark Cooper. Okay. She's here. Perfect. Okay. I can share your uh, PPT if you thank want. You know, yeah, that would be great. <clears throat> yes. Okay. See. Sure. Sí. Okay. Okay. I can just see the bottom of the screen. So um, that's great. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's, um, it's such a, a great moment to be invited to be part of this very special event, even though I'm quite a long way away in Scotland. Um, the Catran Echo Museum which is uh, what I'm going to talk about, has a chapter in this wonderful book. Um, Echo Museums and Climate Change, describing our Museum of Rapid Transition program, which we launched in 2021. The objective of the program is to engage people with our natural and cultural heritage in ways that help mobilize them for climate action and transition to more regenerative lifestyles. In a nutshell, we aim to show how the story of our past can help guide the story of our future. Nuncia, if you wouldn't mind moving on to the next slide, that would be great. The programme, now able to continue this year um, and next, thanks to new funding from our National Lottery Heritage Fund, which recognised the importance of the work that we were doing in climate action, co-designs heritage-based activities with our communities that aim to show that the best way to tackle these crises is to recognise that all things are connected and that we need to fully understand our interdependency with all life on Earth and transform how we live before it's too late. I believe that the capacity for Echo to help people look back to clues to the world together with their place is It's unique and powerful opportunities to help mainstream this need to rule worldview. In essence, that can tell a new story of place. So how does it shape how we understand what, our place in it and our ability to change it? And stories help us how things can be different. And tell you this new story, whilst the future comes out of the past, the future is unwritten, we can change the story. But I think it's a really powerful thing that Echo Museums do right now. So the activities that I think Echo Museums should be developing are all about creating new stories that bring us together, enabling us to connect across our differences, challenge the status quo, lighting up the paths for change, and helping us imagine that anything is possible. Next slide, please, Nuncia. And with all the diversity present in the Echo Museum movement, the opportunities to show that, as John Muir famously said, when we try to pick up anything by itself, we find it hitched and it impacts in the universe of limits. So here are three examples of new stories that we're beginning to try to tell here in Tayside in Scotland. So picking up on Michael Jacobson's work, we're developing a new exhibition about past periods of rapid transition in food production to support a new regional initiative trying to work out how to feed Tayside through the climate crisis and the rapid transition to more localised supply chains we will need to design when we succeed. Secondly, we're helping to develop a new public engagement program for a major watershed restoration project in the Echo Museum geography. Our role is to bring a paleo environmental perspective to how past human made changes in the landscape of the watershed have driven biodiversity collapse and made the impact of extreme weather events worse. Our hope is that by involving local people in collecting this paleo environmental data, so that we can tell this past story in a way that is relevant to the climate and biodiversity crisis we face now, will help generate the development of a new story about how this important watershed is restored. And thirdly, we're part of a core group setting up Scotland's first bioregional initiative, Bioregion in Tayside. Bioregions are, in my view, very similar to Echo Museums in that they reframe how we see our place and therefore offer the, offer the opportunity to tell a new story about that place. Looking through a bioregional lens transforms shires and cities into biomes and watersheds, inspiring us to reperceive our interdependence with the natural world 
and bring us back into a healthy, balanced coexistence with each other. In essence, it's a new name for a very old idea, as all humans understood this up until a few hundred years ago. And I do wonder whether another activity that might be developed in the future might not be to either Ecomuseum setting up bioregions or teaming up with existing bioregional initiatives all over the world. Andrew Sims, who coined the phrase Museum of Rapid Transition, reminds us that museums are physical manifestations of civilization's collective memories, inventories of the traces left in us by the past. They are also vital stories of change in our behaviour, culture, economy and technology. And by showing us how much we have changed before, museums remind us of our ability to change now and help us learn the lessons of the past to illuminate the paths ahead. They're more important now than ever as we face a challenge unprecedented in scale and speed to prevent the loss of the climate and biosphere which gave civilization a home. So thank you very much. Sorry, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know if you are me. Did you are me from home? I'm sorry because I forgot to switch on the microphone. Okay. Okay, Edo, do you want to? Are you ready? Can you talk now? Yes, okay. I can. I can. Okay. Very, very quick. Okay. Yes, so, no, no, no. You, you, can you listen? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes, please. Well, unfortunately, I could not join you at Bicocca University. Anyway, many thanks for invitation. It is like I'm, I'm there with you. I would have greeted you in person, especially Peter Davis, whom I had met years ago, always at Bicocca. So uh, now I make a detour, a dribble. I would skip uh, just to, to illustrate the best practices of the Museum Martesano, which are already written in the book. I, I would like to come to conclusions immediately, just to save time. Well, first of all, we should acquire awareness of the existence of the Museum realities, as the Eco Museum marks the transition from the single perception of a place of a theme to an overall vision. Further on, territorial heritage, especially the perception we have of it, changes from day to day and changes in relation to the dynamism of reality. And our reality is somewhat problematic regarding the climate challenge. So, if uh, the Eco Museum is an expression of a collaborative will of local actors in taking care of their territory and heritage, so I think one of the most goal, goal of the Eco Museum is just to take care and we should act in consequence. But here is here lies the greatest difficulty. Generally speaking, Everyone agrees on tackling the climate challenge. In reality, however, few work to bring our land sustainable. One of the major difficulties we should face is the lack of adherence to the requested actions. Why this? Because action remains on generalities. Instead, the, the action should be set into the reality of small daily action. I think this is the most important key point, the daily action. Big challenges scare. Small ones, on the contrary, can be faced with more relief and resolved as well. We should give people the satisfaction of achieving some small results. We must continue 
on this path and try to involve people in their daily lives. All these small actions should be defined and calibrated on the specific needs of the Eco Museum, taken in themselves if we want to be realistic. So, a special recommendation. It's a sort of invitation to launch a proposal to create a platform to explore the most widespread and parallel critical points of the situations of all eco-museums all over the world. Because starting from these critical issues, it would, it would be then possible to speak a unique language on everyday life, which is the language spoken by eco-museums. Moreover, to ascertain possib possible conver convergence of interest within the eco-museum panorama in order to face them with a common intention, step by step. Because proceeding step by step in the everyday life, that is, according to me, the key point to unify the actions of all eco museum all over the world. I have been very short because I want to save time, but I, I would uh, say once again that we should consider small daily actions regarding everyday life. We should proceed step by step. We should give the people the satisfaction of, satisfaction of achieving some small results. Otherwise, it would be frustrating. And uh, I think it, is, it would be a good thing to create a world platform where all the museums just could uh, underline their critical points. And starting from these critical points, we can then just face them in a more realistic way. So this is a sort of invitation. I think that if, you, if you'd like to know the best practice of the Museo Martesana, they are already written in the book. So I, do, I, won't, I won't just uh, as, um, as waste time. This is my proposal to create a platform starting from everyday life, because if we want to face the climate challenge, we, we haven't the force, the strength to uh, face them, generally speaking, uh, the great ones. We should consider the small ones. Many thanks to all of you, and in particular to Nuncia Borelli, Rao del Santo, and Peter Davis, because they have done a very, very good work. And I think that their invitation is just to proceed on this road. That's why I made this proposal. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm not, I can't, I can't hear your voice. Probably there is a problem with the audio. Is it mine or yours? Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Edo. Sorry um, um, for your contribution. It was very nice and very useful. We are going very fast because, uh, as you say, there are uh, many contributions, and so we would like to ask to Gelson to take the word if he is ready. Are you ready, Gelson? Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, first, I, I would like to apologize for my English. It's an immense pleasure to, to be here and the launch of the book, Eco-Museum and Climate Change, having it, if remotely, 
I would hate, hate uh, uh, hard, uh, to be with you in Milan and hug each and one of you personality. Uh, I would like to thank ABRENC, Associação Brasileira de Eco Museus e Museus Comunitários, for the initial nomination to represent in 2021 at Precop 26. And thank you for inviting Nunzia Borelli, uh, Peter Davis, and Raul Dal Santo to participate in this beautiful and fundamental book. Peter, I appreciate your presentation, presentation about the book. In it, I had the honor of writing the chapter Climate Action of Eco Museu Ilha Grande Brasil for the Sustainable Development Goals. I took uh, some images quickly uh, for the, uh, just for an overview. Uh, the experience of the Precop conference in writing the book helped strengthen the role of Eco Museu Ilha Grande in climate action, contributing to a broader view of the set of the project and, and how they are articulating in different issues and objectives. The articulation of teams in, in this interdisciplinary way, as well in common action between a university and community is the basis of our mission. And the next. The next, please. The mission uh, of uh, Ilha Grande, Eco Museu Ilha Grande is to incorporate the community as the subject of the process of conservation and sustainable development of the territory of Ilha Grande through the preservation, research, valorization, and dissemination of history, memory, culture, and identity, identity places, as well as the natural, tangible, and intangible heritage, promoting reflection and concert action. The Eco Museu Ilha Grande is both Eco Museu and Universe Museum, a unit of the prohectory in the extraction and culture of this State University of Rio de Janeiro, UERJ, Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro, which carries out preservation, investigation, and dissemination of activities of environment, history, and social cultural life on the island. Uh, in comprehensive the fourth session, Museu de Cáceres, Prison Museum, uh, Museu do Meio Ambiente, uh, Environment Museum, Parque Botânico, Botanical Park, and the Central Multimedia, Multimedia Center. Its territory is Island itself. The local population is made up uh, resident of Vila dos Rios and the other communities on the island, developing research, teaching, and station activities. Next, Nuzia, you can test in, um, that's in that year, over and over, please. God, a powerful instruction, pardon, a powerful instrument used the, by the Yucca Museo Ilha Grande, the actions and projects in the 21st agent is the SG, is the SG together and separately and fundamental for us. Briefly, we like the following project for the book. And next, for, please. Uh, is the park in center, multimedia center, please, Ness. Yes, it's very complex, uh, Eco Museo. Uh, Museo do Cárcere, uh, Prison Museum, and the said in, in, in Living Center, uh, my equip, my team, please, Ness. Ness, please. Well, uh, this is project Eco, uh, uh, Recycle Eco Museum that works with the use of the various solid waste, but mainly pet nest. Uh, uh, Marilda Cayares uh, is an uh, our artisan principal. Uh, project Marini uh, Biodiversity of Ilha Grande Bay, Marini Biology, a uh, way to tell the stories of the sea, monitor marine monitoring of Ilha Grande Bay, like monitor sea, a joke, né? research the marine life. Ness. Yeah, I, uh, same, Ness, Ness, please. Uh, and community by, oh, please, wait. <laughs> uh, I return, please, great. Uh, well, uh, the development of new technologies of no, no, uh, forward. Uh, uh, what uh, development of new technologies of milk? Uh, what is the performance in ecological themes and climate actions? 
do you do our contribute to knowledge and solutions to the climate crisis aiming to integral development and environment balance yes please yeah. Ilha Grande is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, Paraty and Ilha Grande, uh, culture and biodiversity from those, uh, 20, uh, 20 and 19 by B. Uh, outstanding example of traditional human settlement and land and all sea use that is representative of culture or cultures or cultures, cultures on human interaction with the environment, especially when it becomes vulnerable to to the impact of reversible change. Human groups live alongside uh, the, the lush landscape and exploit the natural resources, land and water, forming an interaction between culture and nature. Traditional community, Kaisara, based their activity on the use of land and sea. We have a great responsibility in raising awareness and training of everyone in the community, especially in the youngest, so, uh, so that we achieve the harmonious development and the relationship between man and the nature and the environment balance. We carry out major visits, itinerant exhibition and in sciences, uh, presentation in school and communities. We develop and take new technologies in health, uh, education and tourism guidelines to the, these communities. What have we do so far? Please, next. Production of diverse content about COVID, 19 prevention, Kaisara culture and other traditional cultures, communities. Marine biodiversity of Ilha Grande Bay, fauna, flora, Ilha Grande, history and memories of the prison of Ilha Grande, and other museum projects and national realization of for life with different teams related to Ilha Grande. Partnership will with our school on um, Ilha Grande with permanent action in uh, community school partnership and pedagogical projects such uh, as the organization and mediation of class visit in Vila do Gil. Next, please. How does the Eco Museum contribute or can it contribute to the integration between environment protection, tackling climate change, human development, and quality of life? Brazil is experience. Uh, uh, Brazil is experiencing a moment of hope with the new Lula government. Since the 2016 a cop of the election of an extreme right wing government, we have faced the weather of our of rights, the lack of resources for social and cultural investment, and dismantling of environment protection, resulting in the genocide of indigenous peoples, as well and during during the pandemic from COVID-19. According to research of the more than 7,000 uh, uh, deaths, about uh, I, I motion and, and, and remember this, uh, Bolsonaro's okay. genocide. Okay. Today, Brazil is back, but there is much to be done. Eco Museum must continue, and next, please, and fully in thing their social community and social. I am I, 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 finished. I in, in most of the really and community of creative resilience and resistance of communities in overcoming current problems and future prospects. The vast majority of CAC museums and community museums, especially community museums, face structural devices, great and material difficulties, such as large research and infrastructure. However, there is hope. It's not and will not be simple, but it's necessary to turn to the crisis into an opportunity. There is not really more, uh, made formula on instruction and uh, manual. Each must, museum must find its way. Its way there, be creative, do what will you know well, and above all, be supported. Next, please. Uh, I show, uh, Ness, uh, you show uh, the slide, the next slide, and uh, in many uh, actions to do Eco Museu Ilha Grande and the last year, 2022. Uh, forward, uh, please. Uh, is a, a very important 
uh, is, uh, is framing weather events uh, in, in frequent search and the torrential rains in Ilha Grande in two days early April, April 2022 with around six six thousand 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 uh, millimeters. The rains resulted in several failing trees, rocks, in landslides and slides and flooding, preventing access to the colony road, a only road uh, to in in the Ilha Grande, yeah. uh, limiting communication by the sea. Uh, uh, in addition uh, to slides, the slides in, uh, in populated areas, some communities we have affected. Villa do Abrão, Aventureiro, four houses destroyed, 20, 20 interdicted, including the INE headquarters, Provetat, uh, 22 houses interdicted, Araçatiba, Praia da Longa, Praia Vermelha, Palmas, Itaguaçu, Beach was destroyed, and the, there were three deaths. Next, please. Gelson, we have to go to the conclusion, please. Oh, sorry, uh, in conclusion. Yeah. Uh, the next, please. Uh, it's some help and the community and the Eco Museum uh, to uh, the population in the Mount Care uh, in Ilha Grande. Please, Ness. Uh, both rental to transport the community of Vila do Gis to the Eco Museum Ilha Grande and Seades. Ness. Uh, actions with different sectors uh, of the state and the government and universe solved the problem, but the actions and project have not stopped. Yes, you see uh, any actions to not uh, uh, Museu Grande proceed uh, up along the last year. Next. 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 Oh, oh, wait, wait. Right. <laughs> Maria, one more. It's one okay. More. Yes, like... No, here? Yeah. No. Uh, oh, uh, uh, before. Yeah, I. Uh, it, this is festival, uh, communal, uh, community, uh, traditional communities. And the, uh, we uh, live to Ilha Grande. Quilombo, aldeia indígena, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, Afro descendants, and something. The Ilha Grande Bay is amazing, also. Uh, my experience is incredible. Uh, forward, last. Uh, any, any, any actions uh, realize yeah, and uh, We uh, we're inviting to uh, uh, acknowledge uh, Eco Museu Ilha Grande Internet, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, sites, uh, enfim. Uh, thank well, you, thank you. Uh, okay. uh, the, 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 the Internet can actually bring us close together. Together, we are strong locally and globally. Distant, but unit. Distant, mais unidos. Distantes, mais unidos. I hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gelson. Thank you very much also because I know that you did some problem in the last period. So thank you to be here for your presentation. Okay, we can oh, ask to you. Ginevra. Thank you. Yeah. She, Ginevra is here. She's here, so she's easy for her. Thank you, Ginevra, to be here today. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation and for this opportunity to be here. I'm very happy to have contributed to such an important study. Um, okay. Uh, no. Thank you. 
Um, so uh, my study examined uh, the convergence uh, of aesthetics uh, and sustainability, uh, focusing especially on the role that contemporary art played uh, within eco museums, uh, addressing uh, uh, the 2030 SDGs uh, in relation to climate change. And this study stems from uh, an increasing convergence uh, that had place over the last decades, demonstrating that this convergence between aesthetics and sustainability is a growing field of research that has seen the responses of artists, art institutions, curators, and currently is uh, involving also eco-museums, uh, asking them to take center stage. Uh, some instances of my studies uh, show how Iki Museums uh, responded to different uh, uh, SDGs. For instance, uh, in the northern part of Italy, we have Eco Museo Valsugana in Trentino, who that uh, acted uh, um, addressing the SDG number 15 and the life on land SDG, organizing a symposium of uh, sculpture called the Stones of Water, uh, a granite sculpture and symposium that aimed to renew the thread of a lost sculpture tradition by recovering ancient knowledge and restoring it through the language of art. And for this symposium, the Eco Museum uh, engaged uh, five sculptors to work on some of the stones uh, on the surrounding territory called Kepena location. And the outcome was uh, uh, the creation of a small open air museum and uh, the creation of uh, a route uh, to follow the Brenta River uh, in order to leave uh, an action that uh, participant and visitor could uh, engage with also later on. Another instance of the Eco Museum of Rimini in Emilia Romagna in the central part of Italy they work on the SDG number 10, uh, reducing inequalities. They uh, launched a call for artists uh, residencies called uh, Public Art Social Portraits. Uh, they wanted to create portraits of elderly population living in the proximity of this Oza Park in Rimini. And uh, they wanted to create a transgenerational dialogue between people of uh, the place and uh, elder people. Uh, another example is the Eco Museum of uh, Casentino in Tuscany that worked on SDG number 16, so Peace, Justice, and Strong Institution. They launched a project from 2016 to 2020 called Stand Up for Africa Contemporary Art for Human Rights. Where in which they involved uh, and engages uh, artists and other migrant artists uh, such as uh, Yunida Herri. Um, and they asked him to create this uh, carpet uh, uh, knitting uh, words uh, uh, related to human rights such as peace, such as uh, unity, courage, uh, fraternity and freedom. And they used the contemporary art as an instrument of social action as a universal means to raise awareness, uh, to promote and educate the territory on the themes of human rights, uh, the themes of welcome, the one of coexistence, as well as the knowledge and valorization of the culture, local cultural heritage. So um, data on Italian and European eco-museums uh, of my study provide a strong example of how many eco-museums have focused on the connection between uh, sustainability and aesthetics. So uh, about actions to develop in the future for capitalizing on the legacy of this experience, I would say that sure, first uh, we would need to collect data about the impact that aesthetics uh, plays to vehiculate sustainability in the eco-museum communities. And second, for sure, we should try to establish indicators in order to measure whether the impact met the result in relation to the 2030 SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much.
<laughs> you were perfect. <laughs> perfect in time. Thank you very much. Okay, we can uh, fast uh, give the word to Jamie and Karen. Uh, okay, we can switch off this one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interrupt. Okay. Hi, Jamie. Thank you to be yeah. here. Thank you very much. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Karen. Thank Hi. you so much. I'm so happy to see you. <laughs> we're very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're going to present together um, to a total of five minutes and no more, hopefully. Yeah. And so, first of all, thank you so much for the, inter the um, invitation to be with you all. Thank you for the invitation to be part of the book and part of this discussion at large. Um, my colleague Jamie Brown, research fellow at the University of St Andrews, and I have been working together on museum, community museums, eco museums for the past eight years or so now, working mainly with European partners, but also notably in the global south. And so, what we would like to mention briefly today is this aspect of um, what we've been doing that has been showcased in chapter ten of the book on climate change and eco museums and really all i want to say is that the invitation to be part of this very special book um, prompted us to really think more critically and more theoretically about what it was that we have been doing in collaboration with the communities especially in costa rica and especially the indigenous communities in Co costa rica as that relates to questions of um, the climate crisis and the actions that we were engaging in there with them and on their terms. Can we have the next slide, please? So before I hand over to Jamie, it's just to emphasize, as you all know, that we've seen that in this context that eco museums, community museums do facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. In our case, we worked with heritage professionals, but also archaeology and sustainable development and practitioners and academics between these people, between local communities, local governments, and also social enterprises, and that all of these can work together for um, different forms of sustainable development. So to our minds, this book, this beautifully presented book, and thank you for all of the hard work that went into it, provides a really lovely opportunity to showcase the best practices and the real value of such methodologies deriving from eco museums. I'll hand over to Jamie now. Thank you very much, Karen. I'd just like to reiterate what Karen mentioned. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to share this with everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure to see everyone's contributions and to take part. As Karen, um, just to follow up on Karen's conversation and discussion there, we do feel that the urgency of addressing climate change and its impact on Indigenous communities cannot be overstated. And such as the aftermath and community led recovery of the hurricane induced flooding that occurred in Rikiri, Costa Rica in 2017. The experiences of indigenous communities mentioned in chapter 10, such as Baruca, San Vicente, and Rikiri in Costa Rica, demonstrate the need for action, collaboration, and the preservation of their living heritage, showcasing traditional knowledge, community practices, and the cultural expressions that are passed down through generations. We must ensure that our young people not just learn, but utilize the knowledge passed down from elders with a seat at the table when decisions are made and discussions are held. If we can go to the next slide, please. By sharing these eco-museum and community museum practices and concepts, we invest in the resilience of these communities and the overall sustainable future of our planet. It is the responsibility of us all, from academics to museum professionals, community leaders, decision and lawmakers, to empower community-led networks such as the Museum Communitarios Network, based across Latin America, to be platforms for community voices to be heard, fostering their sense of place, resilience, needs and wants, but also building community agency, community shaping their own sustainable future in their own terms. Let me go to the next slide. And finally, we just wanted to showcase this fantastic photograph of our young people working within our research um, in the Reykjavik uh, Community Museum based in Costa Rica. Thank you so much, everyone.
And before we finish, we might just say a very special thank you to Peter Davis. <laughs> who has been who has been the linchpin in most of the, the work that we've done together, um, and we just yeah we just want to say a special thank you to Peter for everything that you've you've done for us and all the different ways that you've supported us, as well as supported this book and Eco Museum Networks globally. So thanks for that. Thank you so much. Yes, we all wanted to say thank you to Peter again. <laughs> Okay, um, now I can ask to Michela Rota. Michela is here, so we are very happy to, if you want to, you can sit down there. It's easy, yes, it's easy, yeah. Hi everyone, I don't have a PowerPoint, so please pay attention to the message. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and thank you Raul Nuncia and Peter Davis uh, for the invitation and uh, Peter for uh, many uh, review of uh, the chapter. Um, I'm happy to be here in this collective moment uh, for a reflection and uh, dialogue uh, around uh, the book's topics and uh, for possible uh, um, new path that we can share to improve uh, uh, what museums and eco museums can do, can do for uh, sustainability and sustainable development. I agree with the many, many statements and best practices that we have uh, um, heard today. And uh, in my book's chapter, uh, I have written about uh, also uh, topics that could be considered to start a path uh, or improve a path to our sustainable eco museums and museums. And also, I've written about uh, a research project called Musei Integrati uh, with many outcomes that we are sharing little by little with the uh, museum ecosystem. But today, in general, uh, I want to, um, uh, I to put an attention. I have written in, in this chapter to push for more, uh, for, for more activist museums and eco-museums for the environment and climate. And today I'd like to share a simple message, but that, that it's not clear and not so um, important for many. We are all involved in this topic of, uh, for the environment and climate change, uh, but uh, uh, I believe um, that this message, that <laughs> I'll explain later, is at the core for any possible improvement in that direction for climate change, sustainability, sustainable development. I recall the importance, um, most of all for ec museums, we already have um, examples about that, to strengthen their, uh, their effort to protect and safeguard the local cultural and natural heritage. A concept highlighted in, with different words also in the ICOM resolution number one on sustainability, acknowledging and reducing our environmental impact and carbon footprint, helping to help secure a sustainable future for all inhabitants, human and non-human. So this link uh, between us and other human beings on this planet is something that we have to put the attention again. And uh, um, about culture, we have to um, to be humble and investigate if the culture that we are protecting is a sustainable one or it's still related to an extractive culture. To start sending new messages and creating new solutions, new stories, new programs, new researches, and in the end to change our behaviors. And we'll reach improvements only if we'll start to act and reconnect with nature. And acknowledging that on this planet we have all the same rights, human and non-human. Starting to recreate this bond, restore nature, safeguard, bio safeguard biodiversity, and not less important, build a culture of non-violence and protect the most vulnerable. So I think this is the message. <laughs> Yeah, 
and feeling and experiencing this connection uh, can be a good starting point and uh, to do something relevant for us and for the future generations. Using collections uh, uh, and objects, uh, museums and eco museums uh, can send new messages uh, and uh, activate new behaviors. And how we can museums can create this path to our sustainability and to the things that I've mentioned, uh, it's all written in the books because uh, I think that in the book there are a lot of uh, uh, methodologies, best practices that can improve, but also uh, we need to um, take moments for ourselves to reconnect with nature. It's not all important to write, uh, <laughs> share this moment, but also stay in nature and connect with nature because we are really one. And uh, um, just to finish, uh, I urge you to read this book, not you, because I'm sure that you have the book and you have already <laughs> read it, but uh, also the people <laughs> connected online. And uh, to conclude, my, my compliments to the other author and uh, also to the editor and uh, you, to you again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution and also to the work that uh, the working group of ICOM on sustainability is doing. We have already, we have uh, not said anything about that. Uh, I was uh, thinking to say something uh, before uh, Henry, but I think that what you are doing is very important. So thank you very much for that. Okay, the last, uh, no, we have now the presentation of Oscar and then we will give you the word to to Ari um, for adding something uh, and for uh, draw the conclusions. Yeah. Oscar. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a te. <laughs> Buongiorno everyone. Hi. This is my presentation. Yes. No. Just one moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the organization, Nuncia Raul, Peter Davis, and the other people. Uh, could you um, pass the next uh, slide, please? Thank you. The organization proposed uh, three questions, uh, and in this presentation, I will uh, I'm going to focus in the second one. Next, please. So, as Peter Davis showed uh, before, in, in Spain, there are around 190 19 museums, 92 are open, the other, the other ones are closed. This is some data about the, how implement our eco museums, the SDG. Uh, the more important uh, factor is uh, four, five, and fifteen uh, is the object objectives. And, but in in this presentation, I am going to focus in uh, in the case study of La Ponte. No, to start with with this, um, I am going to to show some words about uh, Utebagin. Please, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> uh, eco museums, like other museological typologies that promote community participation, proposed a change in the way of understanding the reason for being of museums in society. It was proposed uh, to transform the museological process into a means of direct participation of the individual and the community, as well as to offer a tool for it, for the integral development of heritage and territory. However, it was his social and democratic sense what made eco museums directly related to the idea of sustainability. The prefix eco refers to a concept of human ecology and the dynamic relationship that society establishes with its environment and the transformation processes of this. Therefore, the concept of Ecomuseum, as created by Utebagin, is constructed 
by means of Greek war oikos, which makes the IQ Museums a tool for sustainability local management strategies. For us, for me and for La Ponte, IQ Museum sustainability is a relationship of actors that is to say a system of human interrelation connected with the territory. Next, please. Thank you. Eco Museums, as a typology and experience that promotes sustainability, encourage inhabitants to become aware, promote and participate in the protection and management of their territories. And on the other hand, they propose a holistic vision of geo-territorial geo geo realities and interdiscipl interdisciplinary work. This, taking into the territorial, cultural and economic policies of any potential region or municipality government, makes Ecomuseums a desiratable element to implement as a political, social and environmental strategy. However, the essence of Ecomuseums has a deeper spirit. Every activity of a social and cultural institution, such as Ecomuseums, generates or aims to propose a transformation in its social territory, territorial reality. The sense we were aiming at is to raise citizens' awareness of their responsibility for their reality, which leads to the sustainability sustainable protection of their environmental. In the case study of La Ponte Museum has demonstrated it is precisely this mm, so sorry, it's precisely this. The decades of work in La Ponte Museum that we have been carry, carrying out in this community museum in Asturias is that at the moment the real endangered species in the rural world is the local inhabitant. Sustainability in eco museums, in our experience, does not lie in the parameters set by international, national or regional entities, because there are uh, exogenous, uh, exogenous to the, our territory, but in the awareness and respons responsibility of endogenous decision making, this is the uh, the main point. We believe, as put in the sentence, that we must understand ecomotions with a network of people, ideas and reflection that are transformed into action. This suppose taking political position in the Aristotelical sense. In my case, I believe that we must move beyond materiality to focus on the interaction of networks of people and work. Uh, next, and thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, thank you, Oscar. Thank you so much for being in time. Thank you very much for and the two answer to the question. Just to one question. Thank you again. Okay, maybe we can uh, ask Eri to uh, give his contribution to one of the three questions, and then we can ask if there are some questions from uh, from public. If you agree, it's okay for you, Ari. That's fine with me. Yeah, thank you. I'll thank just you. Uh, share my screen. Okay, so I mean, just to say a few words because I'll I'll speak uh, at the end for some some mm. conclusions. Um, it's just to say a little bit about um, some of my my own work and some highlight some. Uh, practical tools that, that we've been working on uh, lately. Um, so, of course, I contributed to the the, the great Eco Museums book, and it was a it was a great uh, project to work on. It was really a great honour to be included among the, the many authors. And of course, writing chapters for a book is one of the best ways that we we get our own ideas clear in our heads. It's it's really fantastic. Um, and just to highlight a few of the other things I've been working on since the since uh, since the time of the pre-COP uh, conference. Um, so the Mobilising Museums for Climate Action is a, is a toolkit that I'll talk about shortly. But then one of the other things I do quite a lot of is trying to help people really understand what the Sustainable Development Goals and targets are trying to do. 
Um, because it's still quite uh, early work for a lot of museums and uh, many in the cultural sector, because sustainable development is quite new to them, uh, less so in the eco-museum world. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about some of these things shortly. But also to say is that one of the things which I notice again and again is that people talk about climate action or they talk about climate change, climate action, sustainability and sustainable development as if they're all the same thing. And they're really not. They're really quite different in many ways. There's lots of ways to act on climate change that are very unfair for people. Often institutions who talk about sustainability are thinking about how their institution uses uses resources and is really quite an internal uh, activity. And sustainable development is much more than that. It's about all of these things together. Uh, and I just included there the, the logo for UN 75 because it's the 75th uh, birthday of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And in a way, it this year, and in a way, it should be everywhere, but almost no one talks about it. And if we don't talk about human rights and people don't even know what rights they have, it'll be a miracle if they get them. And so it's really just to highlight this, that sustainable development goals are very much more than climate action or using resources carefully. They're about all of these things together. They're about intergenerational equity, but they're also much more as a program that is about involving more people, in fact, all people in shaping the future, because the only way that we can have a strong public mandate for particular directions is if people are involved in shaping those directions. And so one of the great things which the, the SDGs do is to give us some, some goals. So one of the, because I worked in museums for a long time, is that museums, they're often quite heavy with having lots of rules, but less goals. So if museums don't have goals themselves, they need to find goals from somewhere else and they need to find the right ones to work on. And so from the agenda, we have the, the aims to, you know, to end poverty and hunger, to ensure prosperous and fulfilling lives, to protect the, the planet for, for the current and future generations, to support peace and to deliver this through partnership. And we could just take those five commitments and just bring them into the museum sector and the eco-museum sector, and that would be brilliant. That would be fantastic. And I'll just uh, highlight two um, projects I've been working on, and this is a uh, one that was done for at the time of COP26. Uh, after the pre-COP conference, we uh, had a competition. We gathered lots of ideas from around the world, uh, and eight of the ideas were shown in an exhibition at Glasgow Science Centre, which was the, the public-facing part of COP26. And I just love this photograph because it's a model from a, a Brazilian team who were their idea was for very small and very temporary museums. This was a model of the museum. And it looks across to the where the climate change conference was. And I just love this kind of negotiation between the policy agendas, a creativity, and small, you know, actions close to home. And this is part of the program for uh, what we call Action for Climate Empowerment, which, um, which Jacopo uh, mentioned earlier. Um, as part of that pro project, we produced a, a website uh, called uh, Reimagining Museums for Climate Action, and we wrote this toolkit to really try to help people understand what climate action is, because it's often talked about in a well-meaning but quite unclear way. Uh, and so really as a very simple blueprint for climate action, which is so obvious, but um, I think is still worth saying because not, not everyone is so familiar with it, that we can think about the two main planks of climate action, mitigation and adaptation, and apply them both in terms of how museums can support society and how they can apply it to their own operations. So how they can support sustainable lifestyles, as some people have spoken about, how they can reduce their own uh, climate uh, uh, carbon footprint, greenhouse gas emissions, how they can support communities to adapt. We've heard that many times today and also how they can make sure that their own institutions are going to have are going to be fit for the future and able to face current and future climate impacts. 
And the last one is to make sure that all of this is done in a fair way to, so that we move away from um, a small, relatively small part of society which consumes too much, which is also tends to be the part of society that makes most use of museums, and how we change what we do to support more of society for a better, fairer future. Yeah, and also, I'll, I'll stop there, Anunzia, because I'll, I'll speak uh, afterwards as well with the with the conclusion. So, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, I would like to know if there are some uh, someone from the audit that wanted to give some uh, say something or give some stimuli or make some questions uh, before giving again the word to Harry for the conclusion. I, I don't know if Peter wanted to add something or if Raoul wanted to add something. Maybe af after Harry, we can just to underline the other two things that emerged, but I don't know. If there is some someone from the, to be connected that wanted to add the questions or, or stimulus, in other case, we can uh, go on to the conclusion and maybe we, I can, uh, I would like also to add something later, yeah. No, I'm checking for in the chat. No, no, did you already see? Okay, no. Um, Raul confirmed that for now there is no questions. No, so maybe you can uh, go straight to the conclusions and maybe we can try to add something in the end. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nunzia. So I'll do this in two parts. Uh, yeah. So I'll do some do some comments uh, on what we've heard this afternoon today, and then I'll look at the um, some points that we co we collected from the different. Uh, authors and so on. So I mm -hmm. think I'll, I've just got a few uh, comments I'd like to highlight um, over what we've heard. So, I mean, we heard from Alberto about the importance of the social role and responsibility of museums and how the old fashioned idea of, uh, you know, just the museum that preserves things as a an end in itself, that is gone, you know, that is the past. Um, and we also heard uh, about how the new uh, museum definition, which was agreed uh, last year, last year, this year, um, last year, um, about how it includes uh, many new concepts or it expands on many of the concepts which were perhaps there in the past, but were not stated in such a clear way. So the new definition talks about the importance of fostering sustainability. And I really like that idea because um, it's something that it has the idea that it's something that continues to grow. We nourish it, we look after it, we take care of it. Uh, and Peter spoke about the idea of the book as a kind of treasure trove of ideas. And I also really like this idea is to say that it's there's no one size fits all. It's something that we can dip into and find ideas and adapt ideas and hopefully in the future add our own ideas because this work needs needs all of us. And uh, he spoke about the image of on the front of about how um, we walk on the tightrope to the sun. And I was just thinking about this uh, as it, it relates so much to the work of museums and eco museums that there's a question of balance, because there is a balance between different parts of society, between the agency of the museum and of people in society and different uh, actors. There's also a question of skill that is involved, and there's a destination. You know, we're trying to get somewhere. It has a goal. But also, if we might fall off. We might find that we fall off a bit, and we just have to pick ourselves up and get back on and keep sticking with the with the tightrope. Um, and then we heard from Unionsia talking about um, social actions and who takes actions and also who decides what actions we should be taking. Should the museum take a back seat? Should, should it just help people? Should it sometimes uh, tolerate that uh, the things that people want to do are perhaps not necessarily what the museum itself wants to do? Yeah, and how do we help people? How do we empower people and stop getting in the way um, to, with their courses of action? 
and then we we heard from Michael who spoke about his museum and how it had really grown from a particular challenge, you know, a real world challenge about um, food and how food is used. Um, and we heard from Franca talking about uh, the diffuse and extended museum and how this is, it can be a, a useful idea as well for, for universities and different kinds of institutions that historically have possibly had quite thick walls that they they would rather were a bit thinner. Yeah, and Jacobo uh, spoke about uh, Action for Climate Empowerment, the part of the Paris Agreement, uh, which is really relevant to the work of museums and eco-museums. And it's about education, training, public awareness, public access to information, participation and cooperation. And very often, ACE gets thought of as being about education. It gets shrunk down to education and then it gets shrunk down again to being about school. And it's about much more than that. And eco museums can really support the participation aspect of, of action for climate empowerment. And eco museums are extremely well placed to do this and uh, arguably much better than, than other kinds of museum. Uh, and Doug and Raul spoke about the Doug spoke about the the inside out his inside out model and really about how what we can call development is a never ending process. It's a social process that we have to find opportunities to take part in how we can support transformative change that is not um, instrumental, that doesn't kind of force people down particular directions. Uh, and Raul spoke about his um, eco heritage project as a, a example. Uh, really, where the ideas, the models, are put into into practice. Uh, Clear spoke about and John John Muir's great quote about how if you pull at one thing, you find that it's connected to everything else. Uh, and really, look, talking about how her um, eco museum in Scotland can really aim to be a kind of catalyst to support rapid transition, which would be fantastic. Uh, Ido spoke about how we can, we also have to keep people on board. We can't just, uh, we, if we take uh, two big steps, we leave people behind, we lose them or we confuse them. So how we make sure that we keep people on board by moving at the pace that works for them, that keeps um, these, the big ideas uh, rooted in people's daily lives and small action. Gelsom spoke about, again, the real world challenges there and about how the challenges are often very connected. That the world doesn't exist in 17 boxes like there are in the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. We, we have the, the, our, the one world, we have our, you know, our realities. We need to try to find the better balance. And he spoke about lots of different ways that they're working there in Ilya Grands to try to involve people so that they are active participants in shaping the future that they will live in, rather than just using the museums to document a, a kind of vanishing lifestyle. Uh, nearly finished. And then uh, we heard from Ginevra about uh, how there are many ways that eco museums are already looking at this negotiation between challenges uh, and how they are brought to, to public visibility through aesthetics and through uh, public performances and so on. Uh, Karen and Jamie emphasized that the, the, this stuff is, not a, uh, is no longer something that's far in the future. It's something that people are experiencing now. It is extremely unfair and we need to empower people um, not just to face the challenges that might come, but which are here now, uh, and the role that that heritage can play in that, and how we 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 need to work to to maintain the cultural practices as part of the practical toolkit that society has to meet these many challenges. Uh, Michaela spoke about how we can focus on. Uh, getting away from the old idea that there are people and nature or people who look after nature, that people are in nature, they are part of nature, and the stronger that we can emphasise our relationships uh, on a more equal footing with the rest of nature, the better things things might be. Uh, and so I'm going to share, and Oscar 
it spoke about the importance of having a, hol a holistic vision that we have in eco museums, bringing together people and place. Um, and how we uh, focus on strengthening the agency of people and networks. Uh, and so I'm going to share my screen now with some some thoughts that were gathered together. And so after at the end of the pre-cop. Um, a while ago now, we spoke about, well, what is it that we need for a, a coalition of eco-museums and partners? And at that time, we spoke about the importance that we need a vision and principles, we need a, the results framework, we can use the SDGs and targets, we need a means of implementation, how we were going to do it, and some follow-up and reviews for some accountability. And so I thought I would return to these um, thoughts again. And so, if we think about, well, what are the particular strengths of eco museums for, for climate action? We can think about it both in terms of what they work on, that is, you know, focusing on real world issues rather than internal or historical ones or collection based ones, but really a strong commitment to the well being of all people, of the society, community, and as part of nature. And so they are very responsive to local needs and opportunities, and also to goals and aspirations. But the strengths of eco museums for climate action are also in how they go about this. They have this strong commitment to co creativity, planning and acting with the community. And this is really helpful because it gets away from some of the, let's say, the unhelpful characteristics that traditional museums often have, where they, it, things can seem very top down or patriarchal, um, and there often feels to be a different power dynamic. And so, they are all, eco museums are particularly open to thoughtful, impact, impactful experimentation, and they can relate to people and communities in a more human and more, uh, let's say, equal way than many museum in a way that many museums would would love to be able to do, but often struggle. And we can also think about, well, what is it that we already have that is working well in terms of the policies, coordinated actions, the support that exists, and monitoring and communication? And I took these four headings from Action for Climate Empowerment, the thing I've, the, I've mentioned a few times from the Paris Agreement, because the more we can line up our processes and our goals and our aspirations in a way that contributes to these, but in a way that we would want to, is actually a really good way to, to make the connection. So if we think about the policies for climate action, we already have many things. We have the 21 principles of eco museums. That is perhaps not a policy, but is a you could think of as a kind of a kind of manifesto, I suppose. We have the two uh, resolutions from ICOM 2019, uh, the sustainability resolution and the one on community museums. We also have the Paris Agreement. As I mentioned, the museum sector often doesn't have goals, so it needs to get them from somewhere else. So why not just you know we could just use the goals of the Paris Agreement and just take them into the that, that these are the goals that we have. Why not? We have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 75 years old this year, and one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. And we have other um, uh, um, agreements uh, worked on since then, the UNDROP, um, un UNDRIP on the rights of Indigenous peoples and the UNDROP on the rights of rural workers. And in, from, in an Italian context, we have the strategic manifesto of Italian eco museums. So we already have lots of policies that we can use, and we can just apply them within our institutions if we want. And again, to look at coordinated actions, there are lots of things already happening that work really well. International Museum Day on the 18th of May is a great opportunity. Lots, lots of places take part in that. This year, the theme was about sustainability and well-being, and these are not themes that are going to go away. So, we can expect something possibly rather similar next year and the years beyond. 
we could also say that the pre-COP ex experience has been a great one as well. You know, we had the event in 2021. We're having this one now. We had this fantastic book in between. There are lots of things that are happening and that can be done. You have your Sustainable Development Festival in Italy, European Heritage Days, and a, a nice cooperation between Italy and Brazil on distant but united eco-museums. So these are coordinated actions that are already taking place, but of course it could be scaled up. In terms of the tools and support that there are, there is the great uh, Drops platform, there's ECROM's Our Collections Matter uh, toolkit, which collects, collects together uh, hundred, now hundreds of tools that can help museums and eco-museums to take part in sustainable development. We could just use Action for Climate Empowerment as a framework for our activity. And there were the eco heritage uh, projects and resources that Raoul spoke about earlier. So again, there are lots of tools and support. And in terms of monitoring and, and communication of action, I think there is fair to say there are less things here. We have ICOM Voices, the, the ICOM's uh, kind of uh, on, online uh, newsletter that anyone can write an article for. There's the general conference, but it's only once every three years. Um, we can uh, communicate our activities um, on International Museum Day, but I think we need probably more, uh, more clearer uh, opportunities to say what we're going to do and then to state what we've done. And then if we turn now to, well, what else is it that, that is needed to help increase ambition and action? So if we need more effective policies for climate action in and with eco-museums, of course, the phrase think global and act local is everywhere, but in a way, need, to my mind, needs a bit of uh, clarification. What does it mean? Because it can become a bit of a soundbite, so it needs to be really clear. What does it mean? Um, we can look at co-creative shifts. Um, uh, at different scales, whether that's in terms of supporting people as individuals, as communities, um, as Claire mentioned, looking at a shift to living on a, in a bioregional way. We, uh, we certainly need to look at more support for funding and policies for decarbonisation and certainly for adaptation because it gets uh, forgotten about quite a lot. And then how museums and eco-museums could be more clearly factored into the regional mitigation and adaptation plans. And one of the great things about Action for Climate Empowerment, because it's agreed by all the countries, it already spe spe specifically mentions museums, why not use it as a, a lever to say, you know, come on, we, we should be included in these plans here. Those who um, make museum and eco-museum policies and give them money could tie that money more clearly to climate action and certainly not to ask them to do things which are very harmful for the environment, which unfortunately does happen. Where, for instance, if um, museum activity gets very uh, closely tied to economic development can be quite harmful. And of course, looking at aligning eco-museum initiatives with major regional initiatives, not just in a top-down way, but to make sure that more people, in fact, all people have a chance to say whether those are things that they would want to happen. Again, with coordinated actions, um, I won't go through them all because it's a great big list, but there are lots of things that we could do more of. We could co-create visions with communities. We could co-create visions with different communities. We could strengthen the role of creativity in climate action and, um, uh, and sustainable lifestyles. We could empower more young people to take part in decision-making processes, and we could certainly help raise the voice of local communities and Indigenous peoples with their concerns, aspirations and hopes for the future. In terms of tools and support that we might need, I think it's one of the things I do notice many times over is that there are a lot of tools. Either people don't know where they are, or they're not sure what challenge it is they're trying to address. So helping people to understand what the challenges they want to work on will help them find the right tool. 
And in terms, as I mentioned, there are already lots of tools. One of the things which we certainly need more of is people to show how to use these tools. Um, I think we need more effective uh, goals and planning and monitoring so that we can say what we plan to do, how we did it, and then look, we did it. Great. You know, to build trust, build accountability, and also to build momentum. Um, in the museum sector and possibly the eco museums, a clearer understanding of human rights, what they are, how we can work with them on a practical basis would be great. And more familiarity with sustainable development, the SDGs, and how to work with them so that they, we go beyond saying that we support them or we, uh, we are committed to them, but to say, well, what, but what did we actually do? What were the challenges? Why did we decide to work on those challenges? What did we do and what, what is the impact? And then what else is needed? Again, a great big long list. Um, clear goals, targets and measures. Sharing joint activities of individual eco-museums. Um, collating eco-museums activities together to show how you're, there are many voices uh, working on similar challenges tailored to local contexts. Using the SDGs and targets to communicate that activity in a way that other parts of society would understand. Playing more of a role in partnership activities like the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which runs till 2030, I think. Contributing to national reports like the SDG Voluntary National Reviews or to more local ones called the VLRs, Voluntary Local Reviews. More effective communication with uh, other stakeholders, Indigenous peoples and local communities representatives. Developing more forums like this so that we can share ideas and learn from one another and perhaps get some emotional support, inspiration and to feel that we're not on our own. And more regular planned shared communications. And so these were gathered just since last uh, Thursday or Friday between the different authors. We, we just um, put together a Google Doc and it's just to say that it's actually really easy to to co-create sets of ideas. Then the next step is to say, okay, well, we can't do all of them. But which ones will we do? Which ones do we want to do? And then the last uh, slide I would say here is this just this is just a quote from Agenda 2030 that the scale and ambition re requires a vitali revitalized global partnership. And we fully commit to this. And it would be great if eco museums uh, and other kinds of museums could, you know, could really see themselves as part of this. And just as my closing remark would be that, uh, you know, a better future will, will not happen by accident. We have to commit to it. And we have to make it happen through our own work. But it's also to say that it's not just up to me or any of us to say what our view of the future should be. That should be something that is made by, by all of us. And a museum certainly, uh, eco-museums have certainly got some strong roles to play in that. So. Those are my conclusions, and I'll stop the share. Thank you very much, Harry. Thank you very much for your conclusion. It's very useful. I hope that you can share this PowerPoint uh, in some way, uh, maybe also on the Drop platform, because it's very useful for understanding at what point we are. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if there are some other questions. I would like just to add three things uh, that in some way were already uh, underlined by, by, by Harry. But uh, uh, considering all the presentation, I would like just to say, um, to highlight just three points. First, uh, considering the, all your contribution, I think that it's very important that we, we, we must go, uh, we need to go on among the division, among museums and the eco-museums. Maybe we have to start to work together. Uh, definitely we have already done it, but it's important that we open a discussion also considering the incredible work that was already done by the Working Group on Sustainability of ICOM that make a lot of publication about uh, how the museums can uh, give a contribution to the sustainability. So this is a point that I think it's important also because we are starting a new research and uh, for this research we are reasoning uh, both on eco-museums and on museums or community museums and 
So uh, I agree on, on this point that was uh, highlighted by Garlandini, but also by Michela, by Rita. Another point that I want to highlight is that we need to explore exploring other fields uh, on which we need to work on for uh, highlighting how uh, museums and eco-museums act or could act uh, for climate change and for the sustainability. On this point, maybe we can imagine to, to write a new book proposal or something like that, where we can collect uh, uh, some contributions, some best practices on other topics. On this point, maybe uh, Nicola Cavalli, that was the, the publisher of Ledizioni, uh, can help us in, on this point. I already talked with him before, and now, unfortunately, he, he left, but I know that there are other possibilities and maybe we can make a reasoning about, about that. Another point that I would like to highlight is that we need to make active the network among eco museums on which we are working for the Eco Heritage Project because it is a resource. It is a resource that already exists and that we need to make active because we work a lot for build such network and we have to activate such network with the new action, with the new project. It's important that we uh, make the e-consumers and, and the museums aware about uh, this uh, platform and aware about uh, how this platform can help us to do. Then uh, I think, and uh, I'm here, uh, I would like to hear to um, quote what Jacopo said, uh, we need to explore new action in the field of education and maybe for doing these things we need to interact with the different kind of institution, the different kind of cultural institution, because they, in many cases, they already done something and they can be, and maybe for them we can be a resource that, uh, and, and for, for us, they can an opportunity to know and to be aware about what is already done and how we can give value to what was already done. So for, the, for concluding this presentation, I would like to just thank you very much for resisting until the end, because I know that the largest part of the people connected and the people that is inside is not the English mother tongue. And I know that it's hard to wear English for so many times when you are not mother tongue. So thank you very much for resisting, and I'm very happy, and I hope that we can be in touch for the future. Okay. Okay. Okay, hi. Okay. Um, do you want, okay, Gelson suggests us to share his video uh, so we can go, we can say bye with uh, his video. Okay. Yeah. It's very, uh, very, very hard. Please do it. Continua, no, fai continua. Ma lo stai condividendo, vediamo. Condividilo. Aquí. Opa, espera aí. Está aqui. Ué. Só um minuto, por favor. Ué. You share? You, you... You listen. Thank you, thank you, Jason. Oh, uh, how you can listen the music? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah. Oh, very, very it, beautiful. Very important for us. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank bye, you bye. So bye bye. Bye bye. We can close. Bye.
Vuoi dire la registrazione? Interrompi.